Thank you for introduction. My name is Satoshi Ansai from Japan. So I will introduce our recent data on sex consumption of Indonesian medical fishes. Okay, so as you may know, in Japanese medical, medical species, so the first sex determining genes of non mammalian vertebrates was identified. After that, Frequently turnovers of sex consumption were found in the related species. To date, eight SD loci and three SD genes were identified in this grade. However, previous studies used laboratory strains and also did not get much genomic data. Thus, several important questions remain unanswered. For example, how much sex consumption divergence occurs in wild populations. And is such sex chromosome turnovers linked to uh, phenotypic diversification and speciation events? To address these questions, <coughs> we are studying using endemic species in Sulawesi, Indonesia. So in Sulawesi, uh, 20 endemic species are known to show significant phenotypic diversifications especially in their pigmentation and reproduction. To identify the SD loci in these species, genomic divergence between two sexes were analyzed using a toolset approach as shown here. To date, we analyzed uh, 13 endemic species and then identified at least six SD loci. Due to time constraints, only a few examples will be presented to today. First, we focus on uh, LG24 containing the most common SD loci in these species. This panel shows number of the sex-specific SNPs on LG24. Male-specific SNPs are accumulated in the same region here, but the size of the divergent region differ differs among five species. Especially this small region contains only 20 candidates for sex determining genes. Then uh, the lead coverage also indicates the differential divergence of sex chromosome among species. In these species, uh, the region seems to be, be repeated, but in this species, the same region seems to be degraded. In addition to this LG24, LG16 uh, becomes uh, another SD loci, at least in at least three species. So the, in all spe three species, the three prime edge of this chromosome shows high divergence between sexes. Interestingly, this region is synthetic to uh, the SD loss, the locus of Atlantic coat. Also, uh, LG4 is another interesting region for sex chromosome evolutions. Uh, in this species, Origius Everse, so male specific SNPs is clustered on the five prime edge of this chromosome. Here, we identified uh, AMH genes. Uh, known to act as a male determinant factor in several fish species like this. So this AMH allele is st a strong candidate of sex SD genes of this species. So in summary, so we identified six different SD loci in a total 13 species of uh, Sulawesi endemic medaka fishes. So phylogenetic relationship of these species indicates that at least seven sex chromosome turnovers occurred in the evolution of these species. So to understand uh, the evolutionary history of sex chromosome in these species, we are planning to do the phylogenetic analysis and also more gene level analysis is needed to narrow down the SD genes. Furthermore, to address these important questions, we are exploring uh, sexually antagonistic genes in these species. Recently, we identified the genes responsible for sexually dimorphic trait uh, in these species, and then successfully assessed the fitness uh, effect of 
these genes using genome editing peaks. So this strategy will be helpful to understand the role of sexually antagonistic genes in uh, sex commercial turnover. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, my name is Hong Kai. I'm from uh, I'm a PhD student from Lund University, and I appreciate I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be able to present some of the findings about how we study the timing of recombination cessation on sex chromosome. Sex chromosome in animals, in like mammals and birds, have evolved three regions where the recombination is suppressed, and it's speculated that this non-recombining part experienced several times of recombination, recombination cessation, forming the so-called evolutionary strata. An evolutionary strata could be identified as spatial clusters of genes sharing similar timing of recombination cessation. Evolution, evolutionary strata used to be demarcated with genetic markers, and usually it is done through studying the divergence of sequences of the homologous chromosomes, like the discovery of four strata on human X chromosome in 1999. Another commonly seen method is to use the multi-species phylogenetic trees, because the recombination cessation at different timings can lead to different topologies. And however, a prominent problem, especially when we try to use it on nascent sex chromosome system of our study species, is that we often cannot get a well-resolved topology, or in other words, many branches have low bootstrapping support. And so it poses a huge uh, challenge that we use the G topology G to determine the timing, um, but we cannot confidently tell when the recombination cessation uh, is based on such a tree topology full of uncertainty. And there are also some other uh, ways to uh, which use the characteristics of, of the strata. For example, the abundance of the CR1E1 element, a line element, was once used to demarcate strata 3 on birds' sex chromosome. And recently, some studies with increasing sampling genes suggest that the non recombining part of sex chromosome may have been formed by a gradual process. And therefore, I'm particularly interested in if there are other approaches to study the timing, and if so, what we can learn from them, and whether increasing, and second, whether increasing the sampling genes uh, can affect the demarcation of evolutionary strata. So in today's presentation, I will start with mention uh, the data set uh, for demonstrating the approaches, and next, uh, more about the, uh, uh, the details of our uh, four different approaches, with a highlight on two alternative um, phylogenetic approaches. And at last, I will mention our finding that the timing estimates could be more um, precise and accurate uh, by using a data set involving multi-species W sequences. Our study species, the gray wobbler, is a pestrine bird belonging to the superfamily called the Suvioidea, which comprises uh, about uh, 1,300 species. And it's found that uh, the sex chromosome of Suvioidea uh, were fused with the part of the autism 4A recently, forming what is called a new sex chromosome. And at present, uh, we have a high quality and well annotated genome assembly of gray wobbler. So we conduct our study mainly based on this species. The data that I was using um, comprises only exonic sequences. And more specifically, the data set has Z and W sequences from six Suvioideas, uh, which include a gray wobbler, and together with the sequences from six bird out groups and the anolyzed. Z. We filtered the gene alignment for 500 base pair, and after that, 51 genes were retained for the analysis. And we use this data set to assess um, the four approaches I'm going to talk about. So the first approach um, is the synonymous substitution rate approach, um, by which we calculate the DS, um, between the uh, Z and W sequences within each gene within the gray wobbler. And for the second approach, the maximum likelihood tree approach, we firstly uh, reconstructed max maximum likelihood tree with bootstrapping um, for each gene alignment. And next, we collapsed the branches with bootstrapping support below 70% to obtain the um, a collapsed tree like this um, example. And lastly, we assigned the tree position range where the gray wobbler uh, w is branched off from the collapse tree. So this example tree here indicates that the recombination cessation occurred before the speciation of blue crown mannequin and sometime after the analysis. And besides, we bring up two alternative phylogenetic approaches. And with the first one, the expected uh, likelihood weight approach, which analyzed with the hypothetical topologies 
And here is one of the uh, examples of the uh, hypothetical topology. And here comes more details about it. So recombination cessation at different timings can lead to different topologies of the gene tree. So based on a constrained topology, for example, this one, um, we can draw different expected topologies. See this example, if recombination cessation occurred before the speciation of um, service wobbler and after the bead reeling, um, we can draw an expected topology accordingly um, with the um, pre wobbler W sequence. So likewise, we can draw a total of 12 uh, hypothetical topologies based on this constraint tree. And with these uh, 12 hypothetical topologies for each gene alignment, we can calculate the likelihood and the likelihood weight across these uh, hypothetical topologies. And next, the gene alignment can be bootstrapped. And this calculation is repeated for uh, each iteration of bootstrapping. And in the end, we can average the uh, likelihood weight across the bootstrapping to get the expected uh, likelihood weight. So for each gene, we can get 12 um, expected likelihood weight um, values. And in the practice, we, we often cannot manage to collect um, sequence data from so many species. So how do we study the timing with few sequences? And we may turn to the BEAST approach. So in the BEAST approach, we use the constraint topology of five species, including two Suvioidea, two non suviodia and the unknown lizard. To set up the priors for the MCMC run, we apply specified calibrations on the nodes of the constraint topology. And in particular, we set zero for all the tips and one for the root. And for the other three nodes, we set the values according to the data species tree inferred with other data. Um, so here we are not trying to date this tree. And next, we set up a prior um, for the divergence node between the Z and W sequences of the great wobbler. And then we let the MCMC to sample along the tree. And after that, we can obtain the posterior probability distribution and with which we can summarize the medium and 95% highest posterior density interval as the timing estimates. And because we set zero for all the tips and one um, to the root for all the trees and other three nodes, um, we, the timing estimates is thus relative in the relative scale and is relative to the root. In this way, we can compare the timing estimates across the different genes. So here is the result figure. Um, the genes on the x-axis are ordered according to their physical positions on the neo Z chromosome, and the y-axis are the timing estimates from four approaches. Uh, smaller values of the timing estimates suggest that recent uh, recombination cessation, while the large values suggest ancient recombination cessation. And due to the fact that the analysis of strata have never been reported in the gray wobbler before and the strata information of other species are mostly hypothetical, so our assessment was based on a simple rule, uh, that is whether the approach can distinguish the ancestral and added Z. And because we know that the added Z becomes sex linked way more recent than the ancestral Z. So um, compared to the DS and ML approach, what we can uh, notice from the W approach is that there is a distinction of the timing estimates between the ancestral and added Z. And distinction is also um, detected with the uh, beast approach. And within the ancestral Z, uh, both ML, uh, ELW, and BEAST approach uh, show genes of ancestral part that near the fusion point um, have recombination cessation before the speciation of uh, chicken. And within the ADZ, both sides uh, show more ancient recombination cessation than the middle region. And with the ELW approach, many genes um, have relatively high ELW values around hypothetical topology number four. Hypothetical topology number four suggests that the recombination cessation is before the uh, acrocephalidae and after the speciation of Savis wobbler. And similarly, with the beast approach, um, these genes um, have the median of uh, time estimates before the split uh, between the gray wobbler and the Savis wobbler. We also did the analysis um, with ELW approach on another data set involving the W sequences from six suvioidea. 
And like I mentioned, we may draw an expected topology with the gray wobble W if the recombination cessation um, is before the speciation of Subis wobbler. And similarly, we can draw the expected topology with more sequences uh, from Suvioidea. And here is the uh, result. And likewise, the genes on the x-axis are ordered according to their physical positions on the Neo-Z chromosome. And with multiple uh, species W sequences data set, fewer hypothetical topologies have high ELW values. And in comparison, the result with single W sequences sequence shows a more uh, diffuse pattern. And remember that the fusion between the added and ancestral part is found in Suvioidea. And if recombination cessation evolves only after the genes become sex-linked, the timing estimates of recombination cessation for the, for the genes on the added part should not precede, predate the, um, the speciation of uh, Suvioidea. And in this figure, the hypothetical topology six um, suggests indicate the recombination cessation before the Suvioidea. And as we can see, using a data set um, involving the uh, single species W sequence gives uh, quite a few questionable um, timing estimates for the uh, edit part. And we speculate this is due to the W sequence has a number of unique substitutions and therefore the timing could be overestimated. And in contrast, using multi um, w species W sequences, data set gives a more reasonable estimation. So therefore, um, it seems that using a data set involving multi-species W sequences may render more precise and accurate timing estimates um, for the added part. However, this improvement for the ancestral part is marginal. So given this result, we may, co we may come to two conclusions. The first one is that the ERW and BEAST approach uh, seem to working well um, in terms of the study of timing of recombination cessation, and they outperform the DS and ML approach. And the second conclusion we may draw is using a data set involving the multi-species W sequences um, can render more precise and accurate time estimates, at least for the um, added part of the neo -sex, cro sex chromosome. And last but not least, I would like to thank, I, I would like to thank my two co-authors, uh, Bang Tenson and Hannah Sigeman. And also I would like to thank the fundings and also the colleagues I'm uh, working with. Thank you for your attention. And I would like to, yeah, I'm happy to take questions. So thanks for tuning in everybody. Um, I, uh, I have um, data on, uh, on strata as well as the degeneration of, of bryophyte sex chromosomes. And after yesterday, I decided to go with, um, uh, with degeneration. Um, so if you have questions about strata, we can talk about that, um, that as well. Um, let's see. So the, um, the, the dominant model for understanding the evolution of sex chromosomes is um, what uh, I'll call the selective interference model. And that really um, starts out with suppressed recombination and suppressed recombination reduces the efficiency of selection um, resulting in the accumulation of deleterious mutations. Uh, that follows uh, with gene loss and um, degeneration. And one of the um, important components of this model is that the more genes that are on a sex chromosome, uh, the faster we see degeneration. And this is really really nicely articulated by a paper with Doris Backrog and is um, followed sometimes by um, dosage compensation. And this is a model that I think many people have, have talked about. Um, uh, I think we all kind of know that it, it doesn't fully explain the, the variation of sex chromosomes um, out there in the world. And so I'm going to talk about uh, the recent sequencing of the Ceratodon purpureus um, genome, in particular the UV sex chromosomes uh, in the species. Um, and uh, so this is a species of, of moss um, and how this um, may um, challenge and, and shed light on, on alternatives to um, the standard model. This paper just came out um, and it was led by Sarah Carey, who was then a graduate student in my lab. Um, and she's actually giving a talk um, later on. The, the main results um, from the paper are that the, these sex chromosomes are really, really large. Um, they're very gene rich and they're very, very old, which um, is, uh, you know, as you'll see, a, a contrast to the expectations from this, this standard model based on selective interference. 
Uh, so here's the, um, the Ceratodon Genome Project team, which included um, an awful lot of people. Uh, I want to point out first Sarah, who, who um, led all, most of the analyses that I'm going to talk about. Um, and we got funding from NSF as well as a, a JGI sequencing project. And many people from Hudson Alpha were really critical in, um, in putting this together as well. So the, the first result is that the Ceratodon purpureus um, sex chromosomes are, are really, really large. Um, so the, the haploid genome size of the moss is about 358 uh, megabases. Uh, about two thirds of that is in 12 autosomes, which you can see on the, the left-hand side in the middle here. Um, and then the U or the V sex chromosome, so males have a U, or males have a V rather, females have a U. Um, these chromosomes take up a full third of the genome. So um, uh, uh, over 100 megabases. And so if we compare that to the human Y chromosome, these are really about twice as large as the human Y chromosome. Um, they're not much smaller than the entire Drosophila melanogaster genome. Um, and they're, they're smaller than the, the Silene Y chromosomes, which are, are, are huge. So one of the main reasons why these um, are so large is because they have massive uh, TE expansions. So if we look at this plot, you can see uh, on the left-hand side are the autosomes. The top bar is um, the gene density across the autosomes. The purple line is um, the 50% mark. So that, um, The autosomes are five genes, but in contrast, the, the um, autosomes have about 46% TEs, while the sex chromosomes have um, almost 80% TEs. So they're, they're jam-packed with transposable elements, which is really characteristic of, of um, most non-recombining uh, sex chromosomes and non-recombining regions of the genome in general. So here's um, one of the things that is, is really in contrast to the standard model based on selective interference, and that is that these sex chromosomes uh, are really, really gene rich. So the U and V each have about 3,400 uh, predicted genes. About half of those um, have some RNA-seq support. Um, this still is um, about twice as many genes as are on the, the human X chromosome. And it's more or less more against a Drosophila Muller element. And then if we compare that to non-recombining sex chromosomes, human Y has somewhere around 70 genes, Drosophila Y has 16 genes, and the Silene Y has perhaps 450. But the, the Ceratodon um, is, is much more gene-rich than any of the others um, here. If we look um, at uh, expression of these genes, that the sex chromosomes um, make the majority of the sex-limited expression in the species. So I have on the top here protonema and gametophores, which are two tissue types. Protonema is a juvenile tissue, gametophores is a more sexually mature tissue. And we can look at the number of autosomal genes that um, show some sex-biased expression in these two tissue types and compare that to the number of sex-linked genes that are expressed. And you can see that the number of sex-linked genes vastly exceeds the number of autosomal sex bias genes. So the sex chromosomes are making a massive contribution to um, sexual dimorphism in gene expression. So why is this? It's really not much of a surprise that this is true, um, that if we look at the, the life cycle, um, that uh, a, uh, an individual haploid female has a U chromosome, an individual haploid male has a V chromosome, um, those grow up through this juvenile filamentous phase to um, this mature phase. Uh, there's sexual dimorphism um, in physical and developmental traits throughout this. Um, the males obviously make sperm, that fertilize an egg that's on the female, and the female gets pregnant with this, this diploid um, heterozygous UV sporophyte. And throughout the life cycle, there's lots of opportunities for sexual antagonism, um, which could drive um, the evolution of, of uh, sex linkage, sex bias, gene expression. 
So we have sexual dimorphism in VOC production at the, um, the haploid stage, which is thought to um, be involved with uh, interactions with sperm dispersing arthropods. Um, there's sexual dimorphism in many life history traits. In the diploid part of the life cycle, there's um, sex ratio distortion um, and parent offspring conflict. Uh, we believe um, over uh, allocation of nutrients across the placenta from the female plant to its, its diploid offspring. So it's not really surprising that there's a lot of um, sex bias gene expression and a lot of it is, is sex linked. Um, the last thing that I wanna talk about here is, is that the sex chromosomes are really, really very old. Um, so the oldest bryophyte UV coalescence that we found is over 300 million years old, um, which if we compare that to mammalians at 160 or Drosophila at 60 million or Cyanine at 10 million. So these are really, really quite old. Um, so how did we do this? We used a, a phylogenomic approach to identify the, um, uh, the coalescences in sex-linked genes. And so if we look um, on the left-hand side, oh, I should say that these data came from um, the 1,000 plant transcript, uh, excuse me, transcriptome data. Um, so if we look at the left-hand side, if we have a male and a female gene that coalesce within the lineage of the species that we're working with, serrated on, that suggests a young sex chromosome system. Um, but an older gene capture <clears throat> would be if we see, as has been discussed earlier, parallel um, uh, clades of, of male and female um, uh, gene copies coalescing deep in the tree. And so that's what we, um, uh, that's what we see. Here's um, the oldest coalescence that we saw, um, which based on, on fossil calibrated trees puts this um, at about 300 million years. Um, I should say the vast majority of um, the genes were younger captures, but um, we found many older captures as well. So here's the, um, the I'm sorry that the, the, the printout is, is somewhat unclear. Um, but um, the main point is, is that um, four of our, our um, genes coalesce very, very deep in um, the moss tree. And then uh, 13 coalesced at the base of the larger group that contains ceratodon. And then about 300 or so um, coalesced within uh, our ceratodon lineage. Okay, so here we have um, an old gene-rich sex chromosome system. And, you know, the, how does this um, uh, fit with our, our standard model um, based on selective interference? Um, so we have suppressed recombination and we can look for um, evidence of, of reduced efficacy of selection. Um, but number two, the gene loss in generation, this is the part that's really sort of problematic, right? That we're, as we have more genes, uh, things like Muller's ratchet and selective sweeps and background selection are all predicted to, to move faster the more genes you have and lead to faster to generation. But here we have a truly ancient sex chromosome with, um, uh, with more genes than the human X chromosome. Um, and then last is, is dosage compensation, which because um, most of the life cycle is haploid, we don't exactly have a need for, for dosage compensation. But we can look for evidence of, of reduced efficacy of natural selection on U and V sex chromosomes. We already saw that there's a massive TE expansion, which is characteristic um, of, of uh, reduced efficacy of, of purifying selection. We also see that there's really, um, that there's clear decreased codon bias, but it's really very modest. So the U and V genes use about one more codon on average than do autosomal genes. And interestingly, this is equivalent between um, a gene that's transmitted only through males and a gene that's transmitted only through females. We also see that there's um, elevated DNDS ratios. Um, so in fact, two to three times as, as high on the sex chromosomes, which is also characteristic of a reduced purifying selection. And again, here, the U and the V are, are indistinguishable in these measures. So, uh, the efficacy of selection is definitely curtailed, presumably by suppressed recombination on these sex chromosomes. 
So how about gene loss? So I've labeled um, these uh, um, phylogenomic strata um, as an A fusion, a B fusion, and a D fusion. Um, we have since any evidence that, that these actually involve neosex chromosomes in the past, um, which um, I'm not going to go over here. Um, but in the A fusion, you know, we see that there, there are four genes that um, are retained. In the B fusion, there's more. And in the D fusion, you know, there's over 300. So that suggests that, you know, maybe that there's, um, there, the D fusion hasn't had time to lose genes, whereas the B and A fusion have, have lost many more genes. So maybe there is some signs of, of, of gene loss. Um, this is hard to investigate in, in any system, and particularly hard in these UV systems, but we can take advantage of um, the fact that uh, these fusions uh, followed a chromosome or a whole genome duplication. And so we actually do have an outgroup within the same genome that we can use uh, for, for comparison. So for example, um, when we make syntony plots, we can see that chromosomes, um, all the chromosomes have a, um, a pair uh, from uh, the whole genome duplication, but chromosomes five and nine uh, lack um, a homeologous pair. And these are the chromosomes that um, are the missing homeologs fused to the sex chromosome. So chromosome five is the this D fusion, the more recent one. And we can uh, make phylogenies of chromosome five and a U-link gene and a V-link gene to study um, is there differential gene loss. Um, and it turns out there's not really differential gene loss between um, a U and a V or a male and female. Um, chromosome, that um, there are uh, equal numbers of, of losses um, between all of them. So finding these homologs is quite tricky. Um, that, um, yeah, as Sarah said, genomes are, are wild places, and there's lots of loss and duplication um, that make these uh, uh, comparisons challenging. But we can say that, um, that the U and V seem to behave uh, quite similarly. Um, the last thing I want to bring up is that the, the genes that remain on these uh, sex chromosomes, which is a lot of genes, um, they fall uh, into uh, sex-specific gene regulatory networks that largely include other genes on the sex chromosomes. And uh, importantly, the, the hub genes in these networks, these gene regulatory networks, are all sex-linked as well. Um, so I know these, these graphics are a little bit um, difficult to interpret, but um, uh, basically the, the, the sex chromosomes become um, their own genomes within the genome, uh, um, contributing to sex-specific processes. So uh, I started out saying that um, the bryophyte sex chromosomes are, are large, gene-rich, and, and very old, and, and I hope those are the, the key points that um, you'll take from the talk. Um, but uh, I do want to pose some general discussion points, which is principally that this selective interference is, of course, very real, right? Um, that we see clear evidence in, in TEs and, and uh, molecular evolutionary measures, but that alone doesn't drive sex chromosome uh, degeneration. And I think that we really need models that uh, incorporate gene regulatory network evolution um, to better capture the dynamics of, of gene loss um, and network evolution, and probably ultimately um, things like dosage compensation in uh, certainly in UV systems. But I think that's, that's an approach um, that may provide a, a more unified understanding of the long-term evolution of sex chromosomes. Um, so once again, thanks for tuning in. Thanks to Mikhail and, and Wen Wan for, for organizing. Um, and I'll, I'll stop sharing and take any questions. Thanks everyone um, uh, for the opportunity to share the research that we have been doing recently on uh, sex chromosomes in the monarch butterfly. And uh, by we, uh, there are several people who have contributed to this. I'm very grateful for their contributions. Um, they deserve more credit than I can uh, talk about right now. Um, so I'm just going to focus on the science. And uh, I have to thank Magda for an excellent introduction to lepidopteran sex chromosomes. 
And um, the important detail for framing my talk is to recognize that female heterogamity reverses the relationship between sex-specific selection and a haploid complement of sex chromosomes. And so in male heterogametic taxa, the haploid complement exists in males, and you have sperm competition, male-male uh, competition that's going to be influencing uh, aspects of the X chromosome evolution. In females, it's going to be reversed, and it's female selection that's going to be um, occurring in conjunction with the haploid complement of sex chromosomes. And so when we want to study sex chromosomes and the questions we want to ask, female heterogamity flips the script uh, in many ways about the predictions or observations we may make concerning the accumulation of sex bias genes, uh, the evolution of dosage compensation, and relatively uh, greater rates of divergence on the sex chromosomes. And so I'm going to try and address these questions in the context of monarch butterfly. And uh, it gets uh, even more interesting because a couple of years ago, we discovered that there is in fact a uh, Neo-Z chromosome, the autosome and autosome has become fused to the ancestral Z chromosome. And this creates a whole bunch of new opportunities for studying how sex chromosomes evolve because we have this sort of uh, two part sex chromosome where we can contrast the ancestral with the more recent portion. And in, and in observing this, we might expect there also to be a Neo-W, but um, it's worth pointing out, as actually Stephen just mentioned, Lepidoptera are achiasmatic and do not have recombination. And so uh, at this point, using the informatics approaches we have, there's sort of no detectable W homology relative to the Neo-Z chromosome. And so I want to emphasize um, these two points a little bit further, just by way of background uh, for the research I'm going to show later. And the first is that uh, we know it's a Z autosome fusion because we have scaffolds that um, are assembled directly across the fusion point in different assemblies. So this is replicated. And uh, the male-female coverage of luminous sequencing is exactly one half all the way across that. And so it does look like there's sort of no part of any Neo-W aligning to the Neo-Z in females. And patterns of heterozygosity also reinforce this, where we see basically no heterozygosity on the Z chromosome, either the ancestral portion, which we would expect, or the Neo portion, in females, but males have plenty of heterozygosity on both. And so both of these are um, capturing the fact that uh, there's a uh, substantial divergence between the, the W and the Z chromosome. And so when we're analyzing the Z chromosome, it really is just the Z chromosome that we're analyzing. So the first topic I want to address is the accumulation of genes with sex-specific fitness or, or sex bias patterns. And in male heterogametic taxa, the expectation and observation is that the X chromosome is demasculinized, uh, like we see here for male bias genes uh, in Drosophila. We expect uh, the, the reverse pattern here in female heterogamity with hypermasculinization of the Z. And so we can ask, are male bias genes overrepresented on the Z chromosome? And there are a variety of papers that do indeed uh, show this is the case for the ancestral Z alone. But there's also this concern that perhaps this is uh, confounded by gene dosage because we have two copies of the Z in male and therefore we might expect male bias as a result of that. Um, and so we tried to find a way to test this hypothesis without using gene expression as an indicator of sex bias. And so um, to do this, we reached out to data from another area of research in my lab, which is uh, focused on dimorphic sperm in Lepidoptera. And I'm not going to say much more about it other than to say we have used mass spec proteomics to identify over 650 proteins in the monarch butterfly that are from sperm. And we can ask, are those sperm proteins uh, enriched on the Z chromosome as might be predicted under sexual antagonism theory? And the answer is yes, at least for the ancestral Z chromosome, uh, the proportion of Z-linked genes that are in the sperm proteome is much higher on the ancestral Z than on the autosomes and certainly on the Neo-Z. In fact, it seems to be somewhat reduced on the Neo-Z. Uh, and uh, in terms of looking at gene expression, we see the same patterns. This isn't my work, but um, I'm quoting here from a recent publication where they did extensive RNA-seq analysis in monarch butterfly. And indeed, there's enrichment for male bias on the ancestral Z, uh, but no bias of any kind on the Neo-Z. And so uh, this is our first instance of sort of distinctly different patterns here on the ancestral Z versus the Neo-Z in monarch butterflies. 
So now I'm gonna to turn uh, to focus on dosage compensation. And as everyone here is well aware, when you have differentiated sex chromosomes, uh, you have a difference in gene dose and that difference in gene dose may have substantial effects on gene expression between sexes uh, and also give rise to um, potentially compensation mechanisms to account for that difference in gene dose in levels of gene expression. And I like to draw a distinction between uh, compensation and balance when we're talking about gene dosage effects. And importantly, I think about uh, dosage balance as being equal expression between males and females, uh, regardless of what the relationship is between the X chromosome and the autosome. And so dosage compensation then is whether the haploid X has expression comparable to the diploid complement of autosomes, or perhaps better to think about it as the diploid complement of the progenitor of the X chromosome. So this is the notion of compensation versus balance. And so we looked at this in uh, Monarch and for both the ancestral Z and the Neo Z, there is a uh, balance. We see that male and female expression is very tightly correlated. There's no shift as you might expect associated with dosage. So we have balance between these two, but um, the difference between um, compensation on the Neo and Z is, is pretty striking, where the ancestral Z is substantially reduced relative to the autosomes. And so it appears to be uncompensated, but the Neo Z is compensated. The expression is uh, about equal to autosomes and also equal to the um, autosomal orthologs and comparative analyses that we did, but that I'm not showing here. And so we have uh, this distinction where we have balanced, but uncompensated on the ancestral Z, but compensated, which is uh, sort of a new observation for uh, female heterogametic taxa, uh, in, or at least it's, it's rare. Uh, and so this suggests that we have different mechanisms happening that um, in females, the neo Z is upregulated, but in males, the ancestral Z is suppressed. And so we've uh, taken a stab at trying to look at the mechanisms here by using H4K16 um, chip seek analysis. And so what we would expect then is that in females, the pattern of uh, H4K16 enrichment is gonna be greater on the NeoZ relative to autosomes, but comparable to the ancestral Z and reversed pattern here in males. And what we see here looking at uh, gene meta profiles, so this is sort of a, an averaged H4K16 enrichment pattern is exactly what we predict where the NeoZ is enriched in females, but the ancestral Z is comparable to autosomes and the reverse pattern, uh, especially around the transcription start site where this signal tends to operate is what's going on. Uh, and so again, we have this sort of dichotomous pattern here between the two portions of the sex chromosome. Finally, I want to uh, address the question of faster Z. We do expect there to be elevated rates of uh, evolution on the Z and X chromosomes, but uh, the reasons for this may differ. Uh, it could be that there's increased adaptation that re re uh, resu um, results from monosomy exposing recessive alleles, uh, adaptive alleles, versus increased drift uh, because you have a lower effective population size on the sex chromosome. And uh, both theory and sort of empirical results tend to suggest that increased adaptation is associated with the X chromosome uh, and increased drift tends to be associated with the Z chromosome and explaining faster Z. In the monarch butterfly, we again see a difference in uh, the presence of faster Z between the neo uh, and ancestral portions. Uh, the DNDS levels are significantly greater on the neo Z portion relative to the ancestral autosomes who are really not very different. And if we break this down in terms of sex bias, what we see is that uh, the increased rates of evolution um, seem to be associated specifically with female biased uh, genes on the neo Z chromosome. On the ancestral Z, it's actually the male biased genes that are slightly elevated, but it doesn't seem to be enough to really change their overall pattern. So we want to ask then, is this uh, Further, is there evidence for drift or selection here? And so we combine these divergence data with polymorphism to estimate alpha, the proportion of adaptive substitutions. And indeed, both the ancestral and neo portions have increases in rates of adaptation, but it's much stronger for the neo portion of the sex chromosome. And there is uh, an interaction between sex bias and uh, the sex portion of the, the, the sex linkage here as well, where we see that female expressed genes, both either unbiased or in particular female bias, have higher rates of adaptation than um, on the Neo-Z specifically. 
we have a little bit of increased adaptation among male bias genes on the, um, on the, autosome, on the ancestral Z. But the overall pattern here seems to be that the faster Z in Monarch is limited to the Neo-Z chromosome. Uh, it reflects increased adaptation that's primarily occurring in females and so points to the idea that it may be uh, monosomy in females that's uh, driving this pattern. It also raises the question, why are we not seeing this on the ancestral Z? Uh, and uh, I don't have a particularly good explanation, but I can offer some suggestions. One may be that the increased ma the masculinization sort of reduces opportunity for adaptation if, in fact, it depends on um, having uh, female expression. Uh, and the other clue might lie in differences in effective population size that we see uh, between the ancestral Z and the Neo Z. And this uh, I really can't explain, um, although we've got some speculation in a, in a preprint which has been recently accepted into evolution. But the important point is that the Neo Z has. Um, effective population size based on heterozygosity, at least comparable to the autosomes, and therefore may have just more adaptive potential than the Neo-Z. So to conclude, uh, we see masculinization on the ancestral Z, but not on the Neo-Z, at least not yet. Perhaps it will evolve over time. The dosage effects uh, are in compensation or difference. It's balanced and compensated uh, on the Neo-Z, but only balanced on the ancestral Z. And we see evidence for faster Z due to increased adaptation in the Neo Z, which seems to be absent on the ancestral Z. So thanks a lot for uh, your attention and uh, for the opportunity to share this with you. And uh, I look forward to any questions and future discussion. Just again, to acknowledge a lot of great people who, who helped work on this. Um, most importantly, Tim Webster, who's an assistant professor at University of Utah now, and Dale DiNardo, my collaborator here at Arizona State University. Um, so I'll skip through just a little bit. I know we're a little bit late overall, but I additionally want to thank the 161 people as well as 10x Genomics who helped support this. So 10x actually contributed a supernova genome assembly that allowed us to do more um, than we had originally proposed in the crowdfunding um, with DNA and RNA-seq. And, and all of these people, um, it just makes me happy every time I, I look to see the names I recognize and um, colleagues and collaborators and just how much support there was to to really make this happen. So what we ended up doing is uh, again collaborating with 10x Genomics um, I, at the time doing their supernova assembly for our reference individual. We chose a male which is opposite of what most people do in mammals where they choose a female so we chose the homogametic sex here as one does because you don't want to have to um, it's better to get double coverage of the Z chromosome here than half of the coverage and have to worry about what's Z and W if you're starting from scratch. And, and we didn't have any other closely related genome sequence to work with. Um, we did, in addition, so because of that uh, donation, we were able to do whole genome sequencing for six individuals, three males and three females, and whole transcriptome sequencing for three females and three males. Um, most of the individuals in the um, on site are males actually. Those are the ones that tend to go out um, foraging a lot more than females and so they're the ones that get picked up by Arizona game and fish. And so at the time we actually only had access to three females but luckily that's what we could afford to do and we had our, our choice of, of the males. Uh, and these are the same three uh, males and females for both the whole genome sequencing and whole transcriptome sequencing. And we did it from whole blood so they have uh, nucleated red blood cells in contrast to mammals. So we really had a ton of DNA to work with here. Uh, we don't have access to other tissues. Again, they're, they're protected. So we uh, collected blood from the base of the tail and, and uh, otherwise just let these critters alone. Great, uh, so what we ended up getting was a haploid genome assembly, about two and a half gigs. So uh, a scaffold N50, of uh, almost eight megabases and a contig N50 of uh, 35 K KB. Uh, and then we took our short read sequencing and compared read depth in males and females to try to look for what could be our potential Z-linked scaffolds uh, with the expectation, uh, and we did find uh, four scaffolds that have half the coverage in females who should only have one Z chromosome compared to males who should have two Z chromosomes. And in addition, we uh, compared patterns of heterozygosity and those four scaffolds had just, oh. well, I'll say, I, 
I say different patterns of heterozygosity, and I'm not showing it here as much because uh, those four really stood out, but rather than having low heterozygosity, um, which is what I might have expected, they had wildly high heterozygosity. And we think that might be due to repetitive elements on the W that might be mapping erroneously to the Z because they don't have anywhere else to go in our reference genome. You know, we don't have a W at all. All we have is the Z-linked scaffolds there, but it's something we're still puzzling over a little bit. Um, but as best as we can tell, these four scaffolds look very different from the rest of the scaffolds in our, our genome assembly and are consistent with being Z-linked scaffolds. So we took those four scaffolds and we're going to proceed, um, based on the DNA analysis, we're going to proceed to look at some comparative genomics to see uh, where these scaffolds might, might fall and if they tell us something about the evolution of, of these. Uh, so what we did is uh, the Komodo dragon genome has been published and we did some computational chromosome painting of all those Gila monster scaffolds onto the Komodo dragon genome. So here on the middle of the plot, uh, you'll see the Komodo dragon chromosomes as annotated and then uh, the Gila monster scaffolds here with the same colors. So the, the purple here um, corresponds to these purple scaffolds here. Uh, I did say we had four uh, putative sex-linked scaffolds in Gila monster, but in the software that we're using, only three of them were large enough to pass the criterion to, to be painted here. And so what we do find though, is that those three Z-linked scaffolds that we identified in uh, Gila monster align to the three uh, Z chromosome scaffolds that were identified in the Komodo dragon genome. And there's been some additional work uh, suggesting that that there is homology between the Komodo dragon and the, the Gila monster sex chromosomes. Uh, but this was really nice to see that we, we do see um, conservation of, of the genes here between those scaffolds. Um, and then additionally, so we took those three scaffolds that we were really confident are homologous on the Z between Gila monster and Komodo dragon and mapped them to the green anole. And uh, the green anole, they all map to an autosome, um, autosome two, uh, whereas the anole sex chromosome, which is linkage group B, uh, linkage group B actually is an autosome then in the Gila monster. So just kind of showing that, um, that we really do have distinct sex chromosomes in our Gila monsters compared to uh, the anolis. Uh, so then another question is, well, what does gene expression look like there? And so, uh, sorry, it's uh, always fun here. Uh, Zina, <laughs> this is life in a pandemic. Uh, <laughs> so we're interested in, we're looking at the log two fold change from females to males here. And so we, that means at zero, you're having equal expression between females and males. So this is from our transcriptome data, averaging the three males and three females, and then looking at the ratio of those. And so this is, um, we chose one of the larger autosomes to compare, but this is consistent across our autosomal scaffolds. And, and what we see is that largely for all of the genes that we have annotated in our reference genome, um, on average, we see about equal expression between males and females. You don't expect every gene to show equal expression, even on an autosome, but but on average, um, if we smooth it out here, we see that you get approximately equal expression of those genes in females and males. Uh, however, when we look at those Z-linked scaffolds, we have those four scaffolds. We don't see that pattern. Uh, we see that on average, we're actually having uh, a much different expression with higher expression. So because this is the female to male ratio, we're actually seeing higher expression in males, so it's below here, than we are in females on the Z chromosome. So right, you're like, okay, well, you have two Z chromosomes in males and a single Z chromosome in females, so perhaps that's not um, equal dosage or between the Z and the autosomes. Um, but what is really interesting is this one scaffold, we have enough genes here. So this scaffold, we confirm uh, the DNA is consistent with it being a Z-linked scaffold, but about half of the transcripts there, uh, the genes annotated here are, uh, sorry, just a minute. Okay, so you go. Oh, thank you. Uh, we see that half of those scaffolds, uh, half of those genes are consistent with potentially a pseudo-autosomal region. So this is something that we need to look at more, but 
It could be that the scaffold was misassembled. Um, it could be that it is correctly assembled and, and really having, uh, this could be a pseudo autosomal region. It could be just that the genes here are very dosage sensitive. And so we're actually getting equal dosage between males and females. We haven't dug into that very much yet, but what we can say is at least for this scaffold, we see some genes that may, may, be, may show equal balance between males and females, and the rest of them really are showing um, an imbalance between males and females. So if we dig into this a little bit more, we can look at the box plot of expression on autosomes in females. And sorry, everybody's down at the bottom of my screen. There we go. Autosomes in females, autosomal gene expression in males, and then the Z-linked expression in females and the Z-linked expression in males. It's a box plot. Um, you have a uh, much tighter uh, mean expression here in terms of overall FPKM. But what we can see is that one, yes, we do have higher expression, significantly higher expression on the Z in males than we do in females. But also we just have largely higher expression on the Z relative to the autosome <laughs> in both cases. Um, Right. Okay. So that's <laughs> the end of our story is that we don't 100% know everything that's going on here yet. Um, what we think is happening is, gosh, right. This has baffled me for a while because what I was really expecting to see is Z expression in males uh, being about equal to Z expression in the autosomes because you have two copies of the Z in males, two copies of the autosomes in males. Um, but what it really looks like, so we actually don't observe significantly different expression between the Z and the autosomes in females. So this is consistent with upregulation of genes on the Z, in females at least, and perhaps these are really dosage, oh, right? They can't be completely dosage sensitive because you have much higher expression over here in males. We don't see any evidence of silencing anything going on. Um, but we do see this kind of upregulation globally, potentially, of the Z. What would be great then is to get transcriptome data from uh, Komodo dragon to see if they're also showing the same pattern. Mm -hmm. Additionally, there's some data from rattlesnakes showing large upregulation of the Z chromosome relative to the autosome. So we still have a lot to do. And again, right, this is this is kind of a labor of love for our lab. So we're we're working on it as we as we can. So. With that, again, thanks to everyone that's been working on this. Uh, we, we got a little bit of additional funding from the mirror to help support the personnel uh, to, to work on this and the crowdfunding that really kicked this off. And uh, thank you all very much.